Joining me now, Professor Peter Edelman, who teaches at the Georgetown University Law Center. He also served in Bill Clinton's administration. He resigned, though, in protest after President Clinton slashed welfare benefits for poor Americans in 1996. Welcome to the show. Thanks so Thank much for you, stopping Mike. by. Very nice to be here. You know, I want to start there. I want to actually start even further back, uh, because in your book on page 136, you talk about uh, three speeches given by Robert Kennedy, who you worked for in 1966. And one of the lines you quote is where he said, we are at the beginning of the beginning and thinking about uh, opportunities for all. In 1996, 30 years later, did you feel like we're at the end uh, when, when President Clinton began, when he slashed those benefits, those welfare benefits? I thought very strongly that we needed to reform the system of welfare cash assistance for mothers and children, uh, that it wasn't working well and it wasn't helping women to get jobs and, and become self-sufficient. The sad thing about the law that uh, President Clinton signed uh, is that it didn't do that. Uh, what it did is just to push people off the rolls and we saw, especially once the recession came uh, in, in 2009 that uh, it was of no help to people who didn't have work and who desperately needed uh, help. Uh, we have food stamps, which was very helpful, but didn't provide enough uh, income. So uh, it was, a, yes, it was a sad time, even though we've accomplished a lot uh, in terms of the good anti-poverty policy that we have in our country. In the 60s, uh, when you were working with Senator Kennedy, um, Lyndon Johnson was President of the United States, the Great Society, there seemed to be this effort to really help the poor. As we've gone forward in time, uh, even this last election, I mean, if you were watching from afar, Europe, let's say, I and you looked at these two candidates, you would look at Mitt Romney and say, well, he's kind of the candidate of the rich, and then you would hear President Obama going on and on about the middle class, no comment whatsoever about the poor. Why is that? How, how has this country moved from that stage to this stage? We should be clear that we've accomplished a lot in the United States. We have 46 million people who were poor. That's terrible. But we ha would have 40 million more people who were in poverty if we didn't have Social Security and uh, food stamps and uh, a number of other programs that we have. The problem is that our economy has changed so much because of globalization. Uh, because of the fact that jobs that we had in the United States have now, there's, there's competition from all over the world, China and a lot of other countries, and uh, they have built up their middle class, and that's good, but in the United States, we have a flood of low-wage jobs. We've become a low-wage nation, and that's really the heart of the problem. Help 40 million people stay out of poverty, still 46 million in poverty. Why? Because we've been fighting this battle, essentially, to keep up with the changes in our economy. You talked about the middle class, and one of your points you make in the book is, as long as middle-income voters think that they have more in common with the people at the top than the people at the bottom, we are cooked. That is the case, isn't it? That is the case, and, and uh, the, the real issue is to get organizing, to get activism, uh, to get people out there as we have just at this moment now in the United States where finally workers who work at fast food places, uh, McDonald's and others, are saying $8 and I can't live on that, especially because I often don't have 40 hours a week of work. We need for people uh, who are organized, who get together, whether it's through unions and faith-based groups and all of that, to stand up for themselves and to understand that something can be done. That way, I think we can get a politics where, where people vote their economic interests. I want to point out one other thing you point out. In a way that we have not seen since the Great Depression, the rich and the powerful are adding every day to the bricks that make up the wall of their separation from everyone else. The banks are in record profits, but they don't lend. The government does not press them on this. The big companies stockpile enormous cash reserves. They don't hire. The government does not stimulate demand for their products. And the answer to the possibility of raising taxes at the top level just to the dozen years ago, remains a resounding no. You say that's crazy. What needs to change? What needs to change is our politics. And uh, I think we took a, an important step in that direction in the November election, re-electing uh, President uh, Obama. Uh, and so we're engaged right now in, in this struggle 
uh, over whether we're going to fall off the fiscal cliff, so to speak. Uh, the politics needs to change. People need to stand up for themselves. There's a huge amount of money, just uh, floods and floods of money flowing into the political process, and yet that didn't carry the day for a big chunk of the electoral results because people got out there. They got angry at the way they were spoken to by Governor Romney and spoken about, and they said, we are going to vote. And so at the end of the day, if they're out there and they're voting, and we do have demographic changes going on in our country, we are becoming more of a minority country. We can move in the right direction. Well, well let's, let's talk about that. You're saying we're becoming more of a minority country. And, and back in the 60s, when you were with Senator Kennedy, you saw poverty firsthand. A lot of African Americans, a lot of Hispanics. When you look at the landscape today, a lot of Hispanics, a lot of African Americans still very poor. Is there a racial component to all of this? I believe there is, uh, and uh, I hope that it is going to change in this century, the 21st century. Uh, there's a lot of things to work on because uh, the schools that low-income kids go to who are disproportionately black and brown are terrible, and that's not going to change overnight. That's, that's a struggle, to, and to change the criminal justice system to make it fair and not be a cradle-to-prison uh, pipeline. So there are things that, that are embedded there that are you, don't, you can't just snap your finger and have it get better. Um, we have had a politics, I'm sorry to say this, uh, that uh, where the Republican side has essentially, by uh, demonizing poor people, by demonizing women on welfare, by demonizing the young men who get put in jail to the point where we have 2.3 million people under lock and key in our country, that's been political. And so uh, there, yes, there's too much. There's too much emphasis. Uh, uh, disproportionate poverty uh, among uh, blacks and uh, Hispanics, yes. Uh, and we have to change the policy. You talked about demonizing the poor. Uh, your old boss, Bill Clinton, said he was kind of annoyed at uh, President Barack Obama for demonizing the wealthy. He said, "I never did that. Why is it okay to demonize one group and not the other?" Well, it isn't right to de demonize either group. Uh, the, the, the fact is that people who are making a lot of money and have a lot of wealth, uh, we should talk about the real effects on the economy and what it costs to run this government. We don't have to demonize anybody. We just need to say what's necessary in terms of revenues to run this country. We had a chance to talk before you came out here about a program out in California where they were trying to help uh, a lot of these single moms transition from welfare to work. Um, and I mentioned to you that the leader of this program told me, he goes, we're not teaching these people to dream, we're teaching them how to dream. They merely exist when they're in poverty. Uh, that says an awful lot, doesn't it? It, it does. There, 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 there are two sets of issues to oversimplify a little bit. Uh, things that are structural in the economy. We have too many low-wage jobs. Uh, and, and uh, in fact, we really, uh, at least right now, don't have enough jobs uh, overall. So all of that isn't uh, on the, that, that's the way the economy is functioning. And then people who've been down maybe for their whole lives uh, are, are children of poverty and then gr grow up. They haven't had uh, the, the education that, the opportunity that they should have had. And it takes more than just saying, uh, go out and find a job. You had a chance to work for Senator Kennedy. You also worked with uh, Senator Edward Kennedy. You also worked for Bill Clinton. If Barack Obama invited you to the Oval Office and said, Peter, give me your best advice. How do I tackle this enormous issue? What would you say? I, I would say you have got to stand up and say what we need to do in this country. We need to attack inequality. We, we need to say that people have to have to pay what they can pay to do the things that are our national responsibilities, and not just about poverty, but about education and about the infrastructure of our country. I would say that. And I would say we really need to work on our education system and everything that we can do to, to, to break the, the chain that we have, the cycle that we have, so that the next generation has a full opportunity to be full participants in our country. Peter Edelman, thank you so much for stopping by. I oh, appreciate it so much. My pleasure.